Okay. So this graph right here represents the graph of f, or the function f. We need to consider which one of these choices would be the graph of the derivative. Now we don't have the equation of the function f, so we can't just take the derivative of an equation and find it that way. We need to be a little more clever about this. So if you consider this part of the graph that I'm highlighting in blue, this piece of the graph is an increasing portion of the graph. This is where the function is increasing. And if you remember from the first derivative test, if the function is increasing on an interval, then the derivative yields positive values. This portion of the graph right here that I'm highlighting in red, that's a decreasing portion of the graph. So from the first derivative test, we found that if you tested values into the derivative and it yielded negative values, that represented a decreasing interval. So I'm going to put a negative sign here. So what we need to find is a derivative graph that's positive from about negative 2 to positive 3. Positive means above the x-axis. And then from positive 3 to positive 4, the graph should be below the x-axis because this is a decreasing interval. So if we look at answer choice C right here, from here to here, this portion of the graph is above zero. And since this is a derivative, above zero means positive. That would represent an increasing interval on the original function, which it does. And then from here to here, from negative three to, or from positive three to four, this piece of the graph right here is below the x-axis which is negative values, and that would represent a decreasing interval on the original function, so the correct answer there is C. Okay, so we have x times the tangent of x. So a couple of things to consider here. Um, since, it's a tr it's, since it's a tangent function, the tangent is undefined it has vertical asymptotes at intervals of pi halves. Um, problem is every single one of these graphs have a vertical asymptote at pi halves and negative pi halves and three pi halves. So that's not super helpful. If you look at your answer choices, really the only thing that is different in all of them uh, is this middle piece right here. Um, uh, in particular, the y-intercept. So all this problem boils down to is finding the y-intercept of this and matching it up with the y-intercept of your answer choices. So to find a y-intercept that x equal 0, um, so pretty easy choice here. If this x equals 0, 0 times tangent of 0 is 0. 0 times anything is 0. So you need to look at your answer choices and find one that has a y-intercept of 0. Only one that does is answer choice f. And this one here, since the numerator has a larger degree than the denominator, this is going to have uh, no horizontal asymptote. Okay, first thing we rule out is answer choice A. Answer choice A is a continuous function. Uh, this is not a continuous function because it has a vertical asymptote of 0. So we need to rule out some possibilities here. This has a vertical asymptote in the wrong spot. Um, this right here has a vertical asymptote in the wrong spot. It looks like we're going to be able to use process of elimination here on this one. This one doesn't have a vertical asymptote at zero either, so simply by process of elimination we've ruled it down that none of these are the correct graph. Now, let's just assume that might not be the case on the test. Uh, one thing you'd notice, uh, in addition to the, the vertical asymptote being a zero, since the numerator is one degree larger than the denominator, that means this is going to have a slanted asymptote. And the way that you find that is by performing the law of division. x goes into x squared x number of times. x goes into negative 2x 
negative 2 times so if you were to have other graphs that possibly had a vertical asymptote in the right spot you would then look to see where the slanted asymptote is and find it that way but anyway the answer here is the none of those graphs match question four um, one thing to consider here is a y-intercept possibly if you want to let both x's equal zero to find a y-intercept um, if x equals zero then zero times anything over here is going to equal zero so the y-intercept has to be zero so look through your answer choices this one doesn't have a y-intercept of zero that one doesn't have a y-intercept of zero okay so we're narrowing down here the other thing to consider since this is a radical function is it may have a restricted domain because you cannot take the square root of anything that's negative so this expression right here 4 minus x squared that has to be greater than or equal to zero otherwise um, this just it would be undefined so to figure out where this is defined we have to solve this inequality 4 minus x squared is greater than or equal to 0 so 4 minus x squared that's just 2 minus x into plus x so then on a number line you place your critical values negative 2 positive 2 then you test some points this is very much like the first derivative test so we're just solving a quadratic inequality so testing points and test negative 3 0 and positive 3 So if I plug in a negative 3 for both x's, 2 minus negative 3 is positive 5, but 2 plus negative 3 is negative. Positive times a negative is negative. If I plug in a 0, I get 2 times 2, which is positive 4. So this would be a positive region. And if I plug in a 3, 2 minus 3 is negative 1, 2 plus 3 is positive. So that's a negative region there. Since this has to be greater than or equal to 0, you want positive values, so this is only going to be defined between negative 2 and positive 2. So you need to search a graph that is only defined between negative 2 and positive 2. And it's this one right here, answer choice F. The domain is from negative 2 to positive 2, just as this domain here is from negative 2 to positive 2. So that portion of the test would be no calculator. From here on out you can start to use a calculator. Okay, these questions here were from section 3.9 where you can use approximation of differentials to approximate some of these values. So 25 Point one, the square root of 25.1, you can think about that as the square root of 25 plus 0.1. So this becomes x, this becomes delta x. So you can approximate this using this formula right here. So square root of x plus f prime of x. Now if f of x, if f of x is equal to the square root of x, and f prime of x is equal to 1 over 2 square roots of x. That's the derivative. You just find that by, instead of having square root of x, you raise, you change it x to the 1 half, take the derivative, and you end up with this. So it's 1 over 2 square roots of x times delta x, and delta x was 0.1. Okay. So x is equal to 25, so this is equal to square root of 25 plus 1 over 2 square root of 25 times 0.1, which is 1 tenth. Square root of 25 is 5. 1 
over 2 times square 25. Square 25 here is 5. 5 times 2 is 10. So 1 tenth times 1 tenth is 1 one hundredth. So we have 5 plus 1 one hundredth. That's just 5.01. Okay, here we pretty much the same type of problem. We can do 7 plus 0.5. So x becomes 7, delta x becomes 0.5. So using this approximation, we're going to have cube root of x plus f prime of x. Now, if f of x is equal to the cube root of x, which is just x to the 1 third, then f prime of x is going to equal 1 third x. And then you have to subtract 1 from 1 third, that's negative 2 thirds. So if you drop that down to the denominator, it's going to be 1 over 3 times the cube root of x squared. So this is 1 over 3 times the cube root of x squared times delta x, which is 0.5 or 1 half. So, and you know what? Just thinking about this, this isn't incorrect, but this would be a dumb way to do it. Seven plus point five. It would be better to do 8 minus 0.5. Yep. It would be better to do 8 minus 0.5 instead of 7 plus 0.5 because 8 is a perfect cube. So we're going to have x equal to 8 and delta x is still equal to negative 1 half here. Okay, so now we plug in 8 for x plus 1 over 3 times the cube root of 8 squared, which is 64, times negative 1 half. Cube root of 8 is 2. Cube root of 64 is 4. 4 times 3 is 12. So this is 1 12 times negative 1 half. That's negative 1 24. And remember, this is a calculator portion, so. Turn on the calculator. So I need to figure out what 2 plus negative 1 24th is. And it's 1.958. Three. So the answer choice is J. Now, if you're thinking, if this is calculator part, why not just plug in the cube root of 7.5? You, you need to keep in mind what we're doing with these differentials is approximating. We're not finding the exact cube root of 7.5. This will tell you it's 1.9574, which isn't one of your answer choices. So, <clears throat> question seven here. So this one here, <clears throat> we can use x as four and delta x as 0 0.03. So then again, using the formula, we're going to have f of x, which would just be x to the fifth plus f prime of x, that's 5x to the fourth, multiplied by delta x, that's 3 one hundredths, or 0 0.03. So this is just going to be 4 to the fifth power plus 5 times 4 to the fourth power times 3 one hundredths. It's pretty easy to just to type into your calculator 4 to the fifth 
plus 5 times 4 to the 4th, multiply it by 3 one hundred, and it's 1062.4. Okay, um, these optimization problems here are from 3.6, or rather 3.7, 3.7. Okay, so we need to find a length and the width of a rectangle that has perimeter 48 meters and maximum area. So this is the function to be optimized for the quantity that needs to be optimized. And since this is a rectangle, the area of a rectangle is equal to length times width. The problem is this isn't a function because it has too many unknowns. We don't know the length, nor do we know the width. So we have to create a secondary equation. The perimeter is equal to 2L plus 2W. And we know that the perimeter is 48. So if you solve the secondary equation for one of its variables, you can subtract a 2L, for example, and then you can divide everything by 2. So the width is equal to 24 minus L. So you can take this value for the width and plug it in there. So the area formula now becomes area equals length times quantity 24 minus L. That's just negative L squared plus 24L. So this is the area formula that needs to be optimized. This doesn't, I guess, necessarily have to be done with calculus since this is just an upside down parabola, it would be sufficient just to find the vertex, but just for the sake of practice, we want to find the derivative a prime, it would be negative 2L plus 24, if we set that equal to 0, subtract 24, divide by negative 2, and you get 12. So, <coughs> the length is equal to 12. And uh, since this is a rectangle, there's two lengths, so the other length is equal to 12. So half of the perimeter is already gone. 12 plus 12 is 24. That means the other half of the perimeter would have to be the width. That's going to be 12 and 12. So the type of rectangle that has a maximum area with this given perimeter is going to be a square, 12 by 12. Okay, question 9 is very close to the same thing. This time where the function that's to be maximized or optimized is perimeter. So the perimeter formula is 2L plus 2W. Again, we have too many unknowns, so we have to create a secondary equation using the given information. Area is equal to length times width. Area is equal to 400 square feet. If you divide by W, for example, then you get L equals 400 over W. So you could take this 400 over W, plug it in there for L. So the perimeter is equal to 2 times 400 over W plus 2W. That's just 800 over W. So, I'm actually going to change this to 800 times w to the negative 1. Now we can take a derivative, drop down the negative 1, that becomes negative 800, and then decrease the power by 1, so it's going to be negative 2, then we we'll drop back down to the denominator. So the derivative, p prime, is going to equal negative 800 over w squared plus 2. So, 
we need to figure out now what the critical number of that is. So set it equal to zero, subtract two on the other side, multiply both sides by w squared. We have negative 2w squared is equal to negative 800. Divide by negative 2. We get w squared is equal to 400. The square root of 400 is 20. Plus or minus technically, but since this is a width, it can't be negative. So w is equal to 20 feet. And uh, we already know the area is 400. Area is equal to length times width. If the width is 20, the length has to be 20. will be E. Well, let's see, it probably helped to draw this out here on question 10. So a rectangular solid. square base and then some height. <clears throat> we want to find maximum volume. So volume is the function that's up or the quantity to be optimized. The volume of this would be length times width times height. So it's x squared times h. That's equal to the volume. We need to create now a secondary equation because this primary equation has too many variables. So the secondary equation is going to be the surface area. So 529, let me write this over here, 500 is the surface area. The surface area on a rectangular solid would just be a combination of the areas of all of these faces. Here, here, all of the faces. There are six faces of this rectangular solid. The top and the bottom of this rectangular solid are squares. The area of a square is, in this case, x times x, x squared. And there's two of those, so it's two x squared. And then there's four sides going around the front and the back and the left and the right. So those are each have an area of x times h, and since there's four of them, it's four x h. Now if we want to solve this for h, so you're going to subtract two, eight, uh, two x squared and then divide by four x. So h is equal to 529 minus two x squared all over four x. So this is what this is the quantity of h. Now, v is equal to x squared. The volume is equal to x squared times h. This is what h is. So if we multiply this by x squared, like it is here, it's going to give you the volume. So <clears throat> this x here cancels with one of those x's there. Distribute an x. So now for the volume, we have 529x minus 2x cubed all over 4. So we're going to write this a little bit differently. 529x to 4 minus x to the third over 2. Now when you take the derivative, we want to find v prime. That's just going to equal 529 fourths minus 3x squared over 2. Now we set this equal to 0. Add this term over to here. And we can cross multiply 12x squared is equal to, I'm just going to write this as 2 times 529, divide by 12, divide by 12, so this is just 529 over 6, take a square root. 
529 is actually a perfect square. The square root of that is 23. So x is equal to 23 over the square root of 6. But if you want to rationalize your denominator, you multiply the top and bottom by the square root of 6. So this is going to be 23 square root of 6 over 6. So that's the uh, base and the height here. Now one thing I should have mentioned earlier, I should have mentioned this on, on uh, all of these. We, we should actually have been testing on these, um, that these critical numbers actually were, you know, minimums and maximums. This one wasn't necessary to test because what we ended up with here, um, well, I, I erased it already, but what we ended up as a derivative was another upside down parabola. So the vertex would have been at the very top, which would then have meant its maximum. Um, so it's, it's always worth checking that your critical number or critical numbers actually are the minimums or the maximums that they're searching for using the first derivative test. But anyway, so we know that at least the length and the width here of our rectangular solid is 23 squares of 6 over 6. It wants all the dimensions, though. Um, so we need to find the height. The height was here. So before we multiply it by x squared. So this is what the height was equal to. 525 minus 2x squared all over 4h. So if you take your value of x and plug it in here, um, it's going to be 529 minus 2. Now, I'm actually going to revert back to the form of x before it was rationalized. It was, let's see, it was 23 over the square root of 6. So if we square that, 23 squared is 529. And square root of 6 squared is just 6, so this is 529 over 6. 2 goes into 6 three times, so this is just 529 thirds. So, 529 minus 529 thirds. is 1,058 thirds. And then 4 times 23 over square root of 6. Let's see, 4 times 23 is 92. So this is 92 over the square root of 6. So, I'm just going to multiply this by square root of 6 over 92. Because dividing by fractions is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. <coughs> so, we need uh, 92 times 3. That's 276. So, 10,058 divided by 276. Twenty-three over six, so ten thousand fifty-eight over three divided by ninety-two is just twenty-three over six. So h is also twenty-three root twenty-three square root six over six. So the height is the same as the length and the width. They all have the exact same dimension. So this one right here, answer choice J is only that fits that. Okay, these, all of these questions here come from section 
So this one here, we're measuring the end of a log, and we're assuming the end of the log is a sphere, um, or a perfect circle, rather. So the area of a circle is pi r squared. So we're using a measured radius here. The actual radius, depending on the accuracy of our measuring tools, uh, the accuracy is within a quarter of an inch. So this is r is equal to 28 dr is equal to plus or minus 0.25. So we're going to calculate the change in a or delta a using da. So what we're, what we're doing here actually is taking the derivative of a with respect to r. So da over dr is equal to 2 pi r. And you multiply both sides by dr to get the differential of a or the area. <coughs> so this is equal to 2 pi times 28 times a quarter. A quarter of 28 is 7. And 7 times 2 is 14. Well, technically, well, let me back up here. It's 2 pi times 28 times plus or minus. One fourth. Plus or minus one fourth of twenty eight is plus or minus seven. And plus or minus seven times two is plus or minus fourteen, so it's plus or minus fourteen pi. So that's the answer for question eleven. Now the percent error is dv over the actual volume in this case. Or <laughs> dv. It's dA over the actual area. We're doing area, not volume. So dA was 2 pi r dr, and the actual area is pi r squared. So if you simplify this, you're going to get 2 dr over r. So this is 2 times plus or minus 1 fourth over 28. So this is plus or minus 1 half over 28, which is plus or minus, let's see, 0.5 divided by 28 is 1.78%, so plus or minus 1.78%. Now for question 13, we're doing the volume of a sphere. It's 4 thirds pi r cubed where r is 8 here and dr is plus or minus 0 0.03. So again, we're going to change, we're going to estimate the change in the volume using the derivative dv, or we're going to, not equal to, it's approximately equal to. So same story, we're going to do dv is equal to 4 pi r squared dr. 4 pi times 64 times plus or minus 0 0.03. On a calculator, it's 4 pi times 64 times 0 0.03. So it's plus or minus 24.13. And then again, the percent of the error would be dv over v. So this is 4 pi r squared dr over 4 thirds pi r cubed. So 4 divided by 4 thirds, if we're just looking at the coefficients, 4 divided by 4 thirds is the same as 4 times 3 fourths. That's just 3. And the pi's cancel, r cubed, or r squared over r cubed is just an r in the denominator. So this is 3 dr over r. So this is 3 multiplied by plus or minus 0 0.03 all over 8. So 3 multiplied by 0 0.03. divided by 8 is 
1.125%. So Yeah. Okay, 15. The total stopping distance of a vehicle, T is in feet, X is the speed in miles per hour. We need to approximate the percent change in total stopping distance as the speed changes from X equals 30 to X equals 35. So, um, our initial value here is 30, and we're changing to 35. That means delta x or dx is equal to 5 because we're changing by 5 miles per hour. So x is equal to 30, and dx is equal to 5. So the percent change is going to be dt over t. So if this is t right here, then dt is going to equal five and a half plus two times two point five that's just five x dx so divide that by t now that's five and a half x plus two point five x squared Okay, so plugging in known values now, dx was equal to 5. And uh, let's see, x was equal to 30. 5 times 30 is 150. So this is 155. Point five inside of here. Multiply that by five. Hmm. I can do this around one hundred fifty five point five multiplied by five is seven hundred seventy seven and a and a half. And then down here, uh, you plug in a 30, 30 squared is 900, so we have 900 times 2.5, that's 2250, 5.5 times 5, no, 5.5 times 30, because x is equal to 30. It's 165. So you add those two together. And you get 2415. So 77.5 divided by 2415 equal to 32.2%. That's the percent change in st total stopping distance. So if you're traveling 30 miles per hour, it takes you so many feet to stop. If you increase to 35 miles per hour, then the percent change in stopping distance is a 32% change in stopping distance. So what is the actual change in total stopping distance as the speed changes from 30 to 35 miles per hour? So just need to calculate the total stopping distance at 30 miles and then calculate the stopping at 35 miles and take the difference. So for t equals 30, <coughs> it was actually this right here, 24.15. For 35, it would be 5.5 times 35 plus 2.5 times 35 squared. That's 
that's 32.55. Now we subtract. I get 840. So the difference is 840 feet. That's the actual change. So if you're traveling 30 miles per hour and then you increase to 35 miles per hour, you stop 840 feet later than you would if you're traveling 30 miles per hour.